Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Pereira. Leaders of India and ASEAN on Thursday discussed ways to boost maritime security, connectivity and trade as Prime Minister Narendra Modi asserted that India shares the ASEAN vision for rule-based societies and pitched for freedom of navigation in the region. Prime Minister Modi underscored the ever-evolving ASEAN-India partnership, terming the summit as the grand finale of the joint year-long commemorative activities organized among the nations. Prime Minister Modi further touched on the religious ties that bind all the nations. Speaking on the diplomatic ties, the Prime Minister stressed that ASEAN is at the center of India's Act East policy. The Prime Minister also expressed India's commitment to work with the ASEAN nations to enhance collaboration in the maritime domain. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the takeaways from the summit. Joining me on the program today are K.P. Nair, Strategic Analyst, Ashok Sajanhar, former diplomat, Srikanth Kondapalli, Professor, Center for East Asian Studies, JNU, and uh, Ram Upendra Das, Head Center for Regional Trade. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, I'd like to begin with you, of course. What were your key takeaways from the summit? Uh, key takeaways from uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, statement at the plenary, uh, first of all, that there are huge opportunities that await both India and ASEAN to strengthen their relations and uh, these uh, stronger ties are going to be beneficial and advantages not only for India, not only for ASEAN, for the region and for the world in terms of the security, stability and prosperity. He, uh, in my view, pressed all the right buttons because he spoke first of all about uh, maritime security because that is an issue that uh, is uh, uh, that has become alive with a number of uh, ASEAN nations, whether it is uh, Vietnam, Philippines, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, five of them at least. And of course, as far as India is concerned, uh, looking at the expansionist policies and the uh, of China in South China Sea, uh, that has become a cause of uh, worry and concern. So he uh, stressed on uh, the fact that there has to be rule of law and he particularly mentioned also the primacy of the United Nations Convention on Law of the Seas 1982 mm -hmm. which uh, should uh, govern uh, relations there. Then of course as he has, uh, as the Prime Minister has uh, mentioned earlier also, it is uh, commerce in terms of the economic partnership and that was also something that the Singapore Prime Minister who's now become the chair of ASEAN uh, for the coming year. He right. also mentioned in terms of the investment trade relation between the two countries, how significant they are, how important they are. And uh, of course, the prime minister mentioned that over the last 25 years, we have been able to take our trade uh, forward 25 times. Hmm. But still the potential in my view, and I think everyone realizes it, that the potential is uh, much larger than that. The th uh, third aspect on this is uh, connectivity. Connectivity, sure. not only in terms of physical connectivity, we've been talking about connecting our uh, northeastern states mm. uh, through the trilateral highway, through Myanmar to uh, Thailand and beyond also that uh, to Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam. So connectivity, both physical and digital and maritime connectivity and air connectivity, because some of the cities, of course, uh, and uh, countries are well linked with India sure. right. uh, by through civil aviation. Right. But much of ASEAN is not linked. Then he also brought in the thousand year of uh, our relationship in Ramayana and Buddhism. Sure. Yes. All right. OK, we'll talk. We'll, we'll continue talking about, uh, you know, the religious ties and, and the, the historic ties and the cultural ties uh, ahead in the program. But let me bring in my other panelists as well. Uh, Mr. Nair, the messaging from the prime minister loud and clear as to what uh, what's in store for India and ASEAN in the, the days to come. But these 10 heads of state from the ASEAN countries will also be the chief guests for the Republic Day Parade, a historic moment indeed, because you've never had that many guests, uh, chief guests at the Republic Day. Is there some kind of a messaging in that? This is certainly an occasion for great celebration, having uh, all the 10 uh, heads of state or government uh, from the ASEAN. 
but what worries me is a disconnect between what the government is doing and the public perception of this uh, whole relationship public you know? perception on which side uh, see if you read the media for example and if you follow some of our strategic uh, analysts the impression is created that the whole effort is to use the ASEAN to contain China, mm. you know. But if you read the prime minister, the readout of the prime minister's meetings, that is that is not true at all, you know. I mean, the prime minister, for example, mentioned uh, the idea of uh, declaring 2019 as a year of tourism, you know, very good thing. Then he mentioned connectivity. And immediate reaction from the media and some of the strategic analysts is that connectivity and maritime cooperation involves uh, uh, freedom of navigation in South China Sea and restraining China, you know. That I don't think that is what the Prime Minister meant, you know. See, the, so the government is trying to cre give a creative spin to the whole relationship, you know. India can do so much with the ASEAN, mm, you know, mm. and the effort, in my opinion, is not at all from the point of view uh, of the government to uh, contain China. Why bring in China into our relationship with the ASEAN, you mm, know? Mm. But it's very unfortunate that the public perception, contributed by many strategic analysts who feel that the environment in the country is very conducive to China bashing. I think uh, it, it doesn't help the relationship with the ASEAN at sure. all. Sure. Professor Kondapalli has a smile on his face. China, of course, is the uh, elephant in the room. And, uh, you know, can you talk about the ASEAN countries without bringing up China, really? Well, we are now in a very interconnected world. Uh, and many issues, they, they will have a spillover effect on uh, other regions as well. Uh, the ASEAN was formed in 1967 with uh, two major uh, drivers. One is the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Second is a nuclear weapon free zone. Now in South China Sea, obviously the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation uh, has a problem because since 2010, the Hanoi meeting, uh, since then there is no consensus within ASEAN in relation to the South China Sea dispute. So there is some trouble brewing up within ASEAN. Uh, in the ARF 26 members, uh, it is reported that some something like uh, 12 countries have actively opposed China's role in the South China Sea related issue. So there is a spillover effect in terms of the militarization of some of the reefs that have happened with the Hongqi 9 surface to air missile systems or the other reefs being uh, militarized uh, by China. But to be fair, even Vietnam or other countries have also been expanding their uh, profile in the region. But, uh, but China's militarization is almost about 3,000 acres of land has been uh, you know, um, 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 reclaimed uh, within these island reefs. So, so since the PCA ruling, Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling, in July 2016, the ASEAN is now a kind of divided house. Hmm. So they approached the United States, where they have had summit meetings like the one that we are seeing now in New Delhi. They have approached the Chinese before. They have approached the Japanese. So in typical ASEAN way, they are trying to kind of balance uh, by bringing in another big player which is India and for India India does not have any sovereignty claims in the region uh, and uh, when Bangladesh went to the Hague tribunal uh, India had given up those two islands which are in dispute so India had sent a signal of being relatively uh, objective uh, for the rule of law uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, on the uh, question of uh, islands uh, sovereignty uh, secondly, on the freedom of navigation, both in the Indian Ocean as well as in the South China Sea, there was the mention about the freedom of navigation issues, uh, partly because India has its own concerns in this region because it's roughly about 45 to 50 percent of India's trade is passing through. And the concept of territorial sea as adopted by, say, China or Vietnam or Malaysia 
uh, is problematic for Indian sure. trade in this region. Sure. So to that extent, it is a self-interest for India, but for largely for the other ASEAN countries as a whole, freedom of navigation provides them with some kind of a counter to China, which treats 80% of 3.4 million square kilometers of South China Sea as its own, uh, as they say, um, uh, un undisputed, uh, you know, so sovereign claim. Right, right. So to that extent, I think uh, India provides for a kind of balancing role. Sure. I do not think it is containment, but it is kind of balancing role. Okay, great. Uh, Professor Das, is there enough space in the region really for India and China to both coexist? Certainly. In fact, um, if you see this entire endeavor, I see it um, uh, from two perspectives. One is this is essentially a bilateral uh, coming together of India and ASEAN mm. because uh, we have uh, historical connect, religious, uh, cultural connect, and we have a very important uh, economic uh, you know, uh, potential which is still uh, untapped. This is one part of it. Second is uh, a broader Asian economic integration. If this is going to be an Asian century, uh, the broader Asian economic integration uh, is something uh, or a canvas in which India and ASEAN want to play a very determining role. If this is so, then hitherto, India was possibly less active in terms of contributing to overall Asian economic integration landscape. And this event of these 10 leaders being here is nothing but a manifestation of really acting on our Act East policy. It is, it is actually underscoring that. Now, uh, if that is so, uh, nobody can deny the fact that Asian economic integration and Asian century cannot be brought by brought out uh, only by India and ASEAN. Hmm. You have to have a cooperative framework where Japan, China, Australia, New Zealand and uh, other uh, countries will have to play a very proactive role. I would add, hasten to add, uh, the fact that historically Indian subcontinent and uh, South Asia was an economic hub which linked Central Asia, Eurasia and uh, West Asia on this side to Southeast Asia, East Asia and Oceania on the other through spice route, silk route, cotton route and so on. Perhaps this is the time when this endeavor of India ASEAN coming together is going to reconnect the eastern side of Asia to the western side of Asia via South Asia and Indian subcontinent and that is why India's proactive role and ASEAN's response that today they are all here together is going to contribute to that and perhaps sure. that is going to translate into an Asian economic integration. So it's a win-win for all is what you're suggesting. Yeah. Okay, great. Moving ahead now. Uh, Ambassador, has our, how has our Act East policy worked really and what's, what are we doing differently now? Uh, well, Frank, uh, very interesting question because, uh, you know, one must realize that uh, Number one, Act East policy is a successor to the Look East policy. And the Look East policy, when it was there for uh, 20 <coughs> odd years, it has <coughs> performed ex ex extremely well. <coughs> Sorry. That's okay. Ambassador, uh, do clear your throat <coughs> and come back to us. We, we, I'll just come back to you. In the meantime, let me bring in the other guests as well. You know, uh, uh, Mr. Nayak, what challenges do you foresee for, uh, you know, for the ties between India and ASEAN? Well, uh, in my opinion, uh, the big takeaway from this, this summit, preceded by the Prime Minister's visit to Manila for the ASEAN uh, event, is really the uh, Philippines. Mm. Unfortunately, we don't pay much attention to the Philippines. You see, uh, people forget that... Uh, Philippines is one country in Southeast Asia with which India has had no disputes, not even ethnic, like Malaysia, Singapore, uh, and all that where Indians historically got into trouble with the Chinese and the Malays and all that. And yet, 
this is a relationship that did not blossom you know uh, when prime minister went to uh, manila in november it was the first uh, summit with the filipinos uh, in 36 years to be uh, held in manila and Ma uh, philippines is the one country in the region which is going through dramatic changes mm. it was um, uh, earlier uh, seen uh, to put it rather uncharitably as a u.s colony but president duterte I mean, when he became president, he moved it away. You know, he went to China. And he seems to have, have a very dynamic leader in uh, Rodrigo Duterte at the moment. Yes, yes. And uh, after the bilateral with President Duterte yesterday, the readout from our side says about talks about India's contribution to Philippines build, build, build program and uh, effort to uh, have mutual investments and all that. See, our relationship with uh, most of the ASEAN countries is now good and Philippines was one 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 blind spot you know one uh, vacant spot and I think the in terms of challenge that you asked what we have to build on is the relationship with the Philippines so that the picture of our bilateral col collaboration with the ASEAN is will be complete okay okay fair enough uh, Ambassador, let me uh, go, come back to you now to the point that you are making about, you know, the Act East, Act East policy and the Look East policy. Yeah, so, you know, there were uh, very compelling uh, reasons why the Look East policy was initiated and launched in 1992. And it did work well for the 20 years. As, you know, we mentioned earlier, the trade between ASEAN and India increased about 25-fold over these years. But uh, then it was found that it has really become stagnant. It has, uh, you know, come into a morass and there was need for further invigoration and giving greater dynamism to it. So that is how it was launched in November uh, 2014 at the East Asia Summit in uh, 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 Myanmar by Prime Minister when he went for, to participate in the first East Asia Summit there. And uh, I can say that, you know, over the last uh, uh, three years plus, it is a work in progress. But in terms of the energy that it has imparted to the relationship, that is truly uh, commendable because it has uh, uh, focused on all the issues uh, where there is huge potential, but where, uh, where in terms of the results, there has not been uh, much to see. Uh, I would mention in terms of the connectivity uh, issue, for instance, you know, this trilateral highway going from northeast of India through Myanmar to uh, Thailand and beyond, that has been going on for a large number of years. But, you know, there are positive uh, indications that are available that it is going to be completed by 2019, by next year. Similar is the case as far as Kaladan multimodal transport is concerned. And when the Prime Minister was participating at the East Asia Summit in Kuala Lumpur in 2015, he uh, assigned uh, $1 billion to promote connectivity, both physical connectivity and digital connectivity. Sure. The other is, uh, of course, commerce. We have spoken about trade and investment. We have uh, the uh, uh, negotiations on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. They have been going on since 2012. I think there is need for us to conclude that quickly, maybe within this year, so that that will also be an indication of the seriousness on both sides, on India as well as ASEAN and the other participating countries, Australia, sure. New Zealand, So you're suggesting that, Japan, that we need China, to... That we mean business to take our relationship forward. Sure. The, uh, so, so you're yeah, suggesting that we need to speed up may, our projects and also over the last few years the pace of the projects has picked up is what you're suggesting and that's what's really changed over the last few years. Uh, Professor Kondapalli, you know the theme this time around is shared values, common destiny. How do you see that being translated on the ground? Well, the uh, ASEAN, many ASEAN countries are maintaining a very high uh, percentage of growth rates. Uh, and uh, also many are kind of diversified uh, with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, HRD profile uh, and uh, so on and so forth. 
uh, there is, uh, since the labor costs are relatively low within the ASEAN as with India, you have a lot of complementarities between India and ASEAN. Uh, so one aspect is the economic uh, one. Uh, second is, um, uh, since the ASEAN is, as we uh, discussed, the maritime uh, related issues on those, uh, there is uh, um, the International Maritime Organization estimated that 52% uh, of global piracy incidents are actually now happening in Southeast Asia. Uh, piracy, uh, previously it was in off Somalia, now it is mainly in the Southeast Asian region. Since the uh, Indian Navy has substantial advantages, uh, this is one area which has been identified for uh, counter piracy missions. Uh, in 2006, uh, India had suggested to uh, to the counter piracy as well as uh, protection of the uh, Straits of Malaccas, uh, which is where the Andaman Nicobar Joint Command and the bilateral naval exercises with Singapore uh, and Malaysia and Vietnam all have come into the picture. So in terms of the shared values and so on, this is one area that is now being worked about um, on the uh, sea lanes of communications and uh, uh, most likely that we will have a uh, naval exercise uh, combinedly with the ASEAN countries in this region. Sure. Um, so this is one aspect of that. Second, uh, economy, and uh, obviously there is also the uh, commerce related, as was being mentioned, right. on trade and so on. Right. In the uh, in the IMF and World Bank uh, estimates, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, they all figure out in uh, big numbers uh, for the next foreseeable future. So clubbing up with them uh, also reinforces the Indian uh, growth story. Uh, to that extent, I think this is also... So we'll be in good company. Uh, indeed. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Das, you know, going forward, uh, sh would it suit us well to look at ASEAN as a block and, and indulge with them uh, in multilaterals? Or should we have bilaterals with these individual countries to take our tie forwards? forward or do you think we need a combination of both a combination you know because two nations when they interact there are certain issues that are very basically um, very much bilateral in nature you cannot discuss certain bilateral issues in in a plurilateral or regional forum so in that sense you will have uh, issues say between india and thailand and india and malaysia or india indonesia which are very different on the other hand, because ASEAN has always interacted uh, with uh, its dialogue partners in ASEAN plus one framework, we would be interacting and strengthening our prime, uh, you know, uh, partnership with ASEAN as a block. Third layer is of the Asian uh, regionalism, whereby the ASEAN plus six countries actually are negotiating a regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement. And then you have on the strategic side ASEAN Regional Forum. So we would be interacting with them, uh, not just as ASEAN plus one, but ASEAN plus one plus plus. Now, these three layers can coexist and they do not contradict because there are certain issues that are bilateral, there are certain issues that are regional and uh, there are certain issues that are bilateral where India is one side and ASEAN as a block and then there are certain issues that are beyond region and it's a larger uh, region which which actually uh, gets engulfed so therefore i would be seeing uh, you know progress issues action on all these levels right uh, simultaneously and there is no contradiction okay quick closing comments now from all my guests because i've got limited time on the program starting with you ambassador uh, what is the potential of the ties between india and asean going forward Potential is huge, uh, Frank. I think if we take areas, whether it is uh, trade and economic cooperation collaboration, whether it is strategic issues in terms of providing uh, maritime security and cooperation, or it is in the area of uh, fighting uh, counterterrorism, uh, providing, uh, having uh, defense engagement, I think there are a large number of areas where both ASEAN and India can cooperate and collaborate. And uh, I think one aspect that the Prime Minister made very clear is that we maintain the centrality 
of ASEAN in all the negotiations, whether it is in terms of uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, it is ASEAN Defence Ministers right. Meeting uh, Plus, it is East Asia Summit, it is RCEP, whatever might be the format for us, ASEAN is the central pillar of our Act East policy and all our engagements in that region. I think this will be very, very comforting and very satisfying as far as ASEAN okay. is concerned because they have been Point very taken, Ambassador, Mr. Nair. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, as we celebrate this occasion with 10 leaders uh, on our Republic Day from the ASEAN, we should not forget how we got here. And I think that is what will provide the key to the future. Go back to 1992, and we, we had to fight at every stage to get into this relationship with the ASEAN, you know. It was after a great effort that we became a di full dialogue partner mm -hmm. with the ASEAN. To get into the ARF, we really had to struggle, not only with uh, the ASEAN countries, but... Uh, with the United States and uh, others. And we should never forget that this whole process was started by Singapore, you sure. know. I mean, 1992, National Day, Go Chok Tong, mm. in his speech, he outlined the idea of an India fever in Singapore, you know. So we should, we should not forget the history. that now that we have got here, that we made a lot of effort and perseverance to get here. Sure. And then we will value where we have the relationship. Professor Kondapali, the way forward. Uh, I think there is substantial potential as well as realization of all these, um, mainly in the economic field, uh, from 80 odd billion dollars to uh, projected, you know, 120 billion dollars and beyond. Uh, there is the uh, free trade area which has come up in 2010, while there is some trade deficits, etc., that are being uh, discussed. There is also quite huge potential uh, because of the complementarities between the two sides um, uh, in all sectors: agriculture, manufacturing, um, uh, make in India, digital India. You know, uh, a host of sectors. Uh, then also in the maritime security, there is substantial. Uh, sure. Uh, for for example, the uh, Indian credit line for Vietnam. Uh, let, let, for let me get let me get Indonesia. Professor Das to close the show for us. You know, tremendous potential. We need to strike the right chords. Yes. What Prime Minister Modi is trying to do in terms of Act East policy, and if the services and investment agreement is uh, ratified by all the ASEAN countries, uh, we have made calculations that by 2025 the present level of trade and investment linkages can be doubled. Okay, all right. On that note, then we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. I'd like to thank all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.